Think back to the schools you've attended. Did they have a grey lady in a disused corridor? A hellhound in a supply cupboard? A secret tunnel to a neighbouring building? The ghost of a former pupil forever roaming the halls? Many schools end up with urban legends and folklore attached to them. In many ways, the legend of the Charterhouse Plague Pit is an example of school folklore. The boy swap tales of the screams heard beneath the cobbles of the Charterhouse School. It's also not the only place to have plague pit tales. Apparently, the oratory in Woodcourt also boasted a legend of a plague pit beneath the school. Yet these stories can be circulated both by students and by staff. They can be cautionary tales or simply made up to frighten the younger children. And it's fascinating how many of the stories I collected for this episode involved hazy details, a ghost in the building, or stories that changed over time. So let's explore some of the school-based folklore that I collected in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I am struggling with my voice slightly, so let's see how I get on in this episode. But we are starting a brand new theme this month, and this was kind of based on the back of some of the discussions I had with patrons in my Patreon about the idea of doing some institution-based folklore. So that's basically folklore set in or around or about institutions. So we're going to start off with schools purely because it's kind of that whole back to school vibe and everything. And I've taken a slightly different approach than usual for this post. So rather than combing through books and journals for examples of folklore about schools, I've actually decided to do some primary research and I asked people what urban legends and folklore they remembered about their own schools. So I basically posted on Twitter and Facebook to see what came up. As a content warning, some of the tales do involve suicide, death or violence in some way because many of them do obviously involve ghosts. So if this will be difficult for you, then feel free to skip this week's instalment and take whatever care of yourself that you need. I have filtered out some of the truly shocking stories that I was told because this is a folklore podcast and it's not my aim to be sensational, but I wanted to make sure that you had that warning in advance. But as it is, I actually remember being told the ghost of a student wandering the halls of North Block at my secondary school. And to be fair, the details are somewhat hazy thanks to the passage of time. And I dimly remember hearing that this kid had toppled over a handrail on a second floor landing and fallen to his death. Now, as far as I'm aware, it was completely made up and I don't think it was actually genuine. And obviously the whole school was redeveloped 10 years ago, so the building no longer exists. But obviously who knows if the ghost still wanders on the site or not. It wasn't a massive part of school life, though, as far as I can remember. It was just one of those kind of things where you happen to mention you had a lesson in North Block and somebody would go, oh, you know, it's haunted, don't you? Kind of nonsense. But anyway, we are going to start off with ghosts, though, because that seemed like an obvious place to start. And Victoria reported a school ghost named Mabel who patrolled the attic corridor beside the music, art and TV rooms. Thanks to her diligence, no one lingered there on their own. Now, this school was originally a Victorian house, so the corridor would have been the servants' quarters, which perhaps explains Mabel's presence. Obviously, there wasn't many more details than that. And to be honest with you, a lot of the stories are the same. People reported remembering a story of a grey lady or a white lady, but there weren't really many more details than that. But it's quite notable that a lot of these grey and white lady ghosts came from schools built in the late Victorian or Edwardian periods. Although I should point out, Dan noted that the white lady in his school would apparently follow you home if you saw her, which is an interesting addition to the usual, there's a white lady in this particular corridor. Now, one school in Shieldfield in Newcastle caught my eye because it was supposed to be haunted by a grey lady. But as Ailsa explained, nobody wanted to climb a particular staircase to the roof, thanks to that story. And I wonder if that is perhaps a form of cautionary tale in the form of folklore, in which the ghost then functions to keep children away from dangerous places. But we are going to come back to cautionary tales later on. Another story actually involved a red lady, which is a lot more unusual. And red lady ghosts, I've never actually covered on the podcast, and I probably should, but they don't really appear as often. But when they do, the death of the woman, because it's always a woman, nearly always involves some kind of violence during a moment of passion or something like that. So they are a quite specific form of female ghost. But the school in question is Hatherup Castle School in Sirencester, once a stately home, but now a preparatory school. And while the legends did actually involve a grey lady as well, among other ghosts, 
it does seem that the Red Lady was the most notorious. And the largest dorm for girls had a shower but no toilet. So if the girls needed the toilet during the night, they had to walk quite a long way along the hall and past the library. And apparently the girls were so scared of the Red Lady that they just peed in the bath instead to save them the walk in case they might encounter her. Now Celeste, who told me the story, didn't see the Red Lady but also didn't know if anyone else had. It was just a rumour that kind of did the rounds. And I think it's quite interesting that where we'll look at these white and grey lady or indeed red lady ghosts, they sort of fit in with the fact that they're old buildings in some way and I think many of the ghosts may have simply suited their historical environment, although they do also seem to have served a function in keeping people out of particular areas. But I can't help thinking it's the historical nature of the building that's kind of attracted that particular idea of a ghost rather than anything in particular. But White Ladies leads us on to discussions of nuns specifically and Elizabeth told me about her school experiences in Liverpool. Her secondary school was Notre Dame High School in Mount Pleasant and it seemed that two 1830s merchant houses had been knocked together to form the building. She was there in the 1960s but then the school moved out of the building later to a suburb and a teacher training college took over the building. But in terms of her time there, as she explained, and I quote, no money was spent on it after the war, so there was a lot of old-fashioned school furniture, including green glass chalkboards, and it was very poorly lit. The turret led to the convent, so you would often see nuns floating about in old-fashioned habits. Very spooky, end quote. Now, the legend itself spoke of, and I quote, a white nun inadvertently bricked up during building work, end quote, and she lurked in the turret. That in and of itself is quite interesting because generally speaking when you hear legends about nuns having been bricked up it's usually as a punishment because they've had an affair with someone else, nearly always a monk, so to have one who's been accidentally bricked up makes a bit of a change. But anyway, Elizabeth explained that and I quote, clearly the sixth form made up the story to terrorise the newbies but we believed it, end quote. And it would be quite easy to believe if you already had nuns clad in white walking around the building, it would be quite easy to believe that there would have been one who had remained kind of thing. And how would you necessarily know if you saw a nun in white at a distance in a dimly lit corridor? How would you know whether you were looking at an actual nun or a ghostly nun? It would be a bit more difficult. Meanwhile, St John's High School in Newfoundland, Canada was apparently haunted by a nun named Sister Beads. So I like the fact she's even been given a name. According to the legend, she was having an affair with a brother from the nearby boys' school, which then later became a junior high school. When he ended their relationship, she took her own life in the auditorium. Now, crucially for the story, and I quote, you were supposed to hear her beads rattling as she walked the halls, end quote. And Katie told me that as far as she knew, the urban legend was only told from the mid-1990s to the early 2000s. And the students also spoke of a rumoured tunnel between the two schools. But interestingly, Kelly spotted this particular exchange on Twitter and she went to the same school in the 1980s and actually said that the story originally featured a hallway that led to the convent. As she never had classes in that part of the school, it was always quite dark and quiet, making it extra eerie when a nun appeared out of nowhere. This particular hallway had been closed by the time Katie attended the school, which could explain why the legend featured a tunnel instead. But it was quite interesting seeing people chiming in going, oh yeah, I went to that school or I knew that story as well. And it just sort of showed how embedded a lot of these stories had become in people's memories of those schools. Then we had a little weird category of creatures. So Liz described the ghost of a huge dog with eyes the size of dinner plates, which if you remember the black dog episode from way back, that's kind of the sort of thing that you can imagine from a black dog story. But theirs was apparently so large it was the height of a giraffe, which is the kind of thing you'd think you'd remember seeing. The legend held that it haunted the school library, although no one knew why. But some people believed the demon to be a punishment with children fed to it. Sarah remembered a black dog slash hellhound with red eyes in the PE cupboard of a school in Hornchurch. And again, the idea of a black dog with red eyes very much fits in with existing black dog folklore. The idea of it being in the PE cupboard, though, really tickled me because I thought when you consider how many kids hate PE at the best of times, having a monster in the cupboard just kind of adds insult to injury, really. But the same school also had a spectral teacher and the ghosts of World War II children. So that's the kind of school I kind of feel like that has got a lot of stuff going on in it. In Back in Liverpool again, Elizabeth remembered Foxy Fowler, a sort of male Jenny Greenteeth from her primary school, and this one had slightly different origins from Jenny Greenteeth, and I quote, I think the kids cooked it up from half-heard stories about a notorious murder in the papers and a local suicide with tales of a haunted house, end quote. So I think in this one it's quite interesting how this one came together. 
But most impressively, Gemma actually remembered the ghost of a stag in the toilet, although the school's insignia was a stag, which explains the choice of animal. Now, while Gemma does have an explanation and at least grounds the form that the ghost takes in some kind of reality, i.e. the school's insignia, the other ones are much more imaginative, and I don't know how many children would have necessarily heard traditional black dog folklore in order to then imagine those beasts in their school. And Elizabeth also makes a really good point about these, this idea of half-heard stories. And all it really takes is one child mishearing several elements, mashing them together, and then telling their friends. And then thus the urban legend is born. And indeed, James actually admitted making up his own local legends based on the horror films of the 1980s. So I think that many of these urban legends and much of this folklore probably has just been the product of an incredibly imaginative child but it's then caught people's imagination in the way that these stories do. But of course, word of mouth is really important to how these stories spread and indeed how they spread fast. And Mary told a really interesting story to show exactly how fast rumours can be spread, particularly among school children. Now, it's not strictly speaking what you would call folklore, but it could in a way be seen as a prototype urban legend because as she explained, and I quote, In 1960, in order to support JFK's campaign, the then 10-year-old Roger Stone started a rumour on the East Coast that Nixon wanted to end summer vacations and free Saturdays for kids. It spread so fast that within months, maybe weeks, I was told the rumour on my playground, 3,500 miles away on the West Coast, end quote. And being able to spread a rumour that quickly across such a vast distance in the days before social media and text messaging, like remember this is 1960, truly is impressive. And it just goes to show that school children can often seem to have their own ways of communicating that defy what adults believe to be possible. And that's where much of the idea of children's folklore focuses on these stories that children kind of tell in their own little private world away from adults. And there is obviously an episode about children's folklore as well. But stories don't even actually have to spread quickly. Sometimes they just need to be believable to be accepted. And Lindsay told me about her school's legend that a dinner lady named Mrs Armstrong haunted the school because according to the legend, she'd been run over outside the school. Except none of the story was true. It was entirely made up. But this story has a named character and a plausible fate for her. So when you hear it, you kind of go, yeah, I can imagine that would actually be a thing. And both of these factors make the story much more sticky and thus easier to circulate. But I did mention earlier that many of these tales function as cautionary tales, keeping students away from parts of the building. And also, in a way, they kind of keep students away from the parts of the building that they themselves don't like. So they're not necessarily coming from adults, but they're just children warning each other. And Karen told me about a legend from her elementary school about, and I quote, the kid who got sucked under the ancient wooden steel merry-go-round and squished to death. It never stopped any of us from using it with wild abandon, just made sure not to let a foot stray underneath, end quote. And while it's unclear who started the story, it does sound more like the kind of story that kids would tell each other. It may even have come from perhaps like a slightly older relative who might have sort of wanted them to be careful in what they were doing if they were a little bit too exuberant with the playground. And then it's kind of gone on from there. But I I quite like the idea that they didn't actually stop them using it. It just made them more careful in the way that they used it, which is probably ultimately the function of the cautionary tale. Kristen's junior school featured tales of ghosts or a creature living in the basement, which is obviously a good way to ensure that children stay away or go exploring, depending on the child. And Harbinger County Primary School featured a green lady who lived in the storage spaces such as the attic and she would scratch children that entered these spaces alone. Now Heather thought that the upper years passed the story to the lower years but again it's one of those kind of ideas if it's essentially keeping people away from a space where they might encounter harm and indeed if you were to go into an attic on your own and something happened to you there's a good chance that nobody would know that you were there for a really long time so it's again it's a way of sort of helping make sure that people stay safe particularly because this one says that obviously the green lady targets children that enter the spaces alone doesn't say what happens if you went in in twos or threes so again it's kind of it has a little bit of an undercurrent of caution to it but while also kind of not necessarily saying don't go in there but just make sure that you don't go in alone but perhaps the most extensive of these tales came from rural northumberland in the sea houses area sea houses being grace darling country if you're wondering Now, I should note that this tale does include the use of the word tramp, since this was the word used by the children in the 1980s. And Peter, who told me about it, did note that using the term so casually was quite callous and disrespectful towards the unhoused. 
Yet in the late 1970s and 1980s in the rural northeast, children didn't really encounter the unhoused, meaning that those called tramps had a slightly mythic air about them, as Peter put it. So while obviously it's not necessarily a word that we would continue to use with such merry abandon now, I have preserved the term tramp as part of the legend as it was recorded. So it's not meant in that disrespectful way, it's just literally the part of the folklore. But where it basically came from was Peter explained that a long wooded lane known as the Lonnon ran behind the school and a dense clump of trees grew near one of the back gates, which is fairly common for these kind of places. And the tramp of the story apparently lived among these trees. He held particularly mythic status because he had a knife for a finger and anyone who walked past and made too much noise or annoyed him would become his victim. He would, and I quote, leap out and grab you, and then the story went, the real horror began because he'd use his knife finger to carve the word tramp into your forehead. It was a monster of the mind, no one ever saw him, but it didn't stop us walking past the cops on nights in the dark half of the year when you left school, and someone would shout tramp, there'd be a rustle in the brambles, and kids would scramble screaming off into the dark, end quote. Now Peter explained that the story originally featured a tramp with a knife, but in 1984, Nightmare on Elm Street came out and the electrician shop in the village had a video section. And as Peter continues, I can remember all us kids going in to rent stuff and there being a massive poster of Freddy from the films up on one wall. And when we got back to school, I think after the summer holidays, the tramp now had the knife finger, end quote. So this is quite a fascinating example of an urban legend taking elements from popular culture because in this case the imagery actually mapped across because of the similarity between a person with a knife and then Freddy's knifed glove. So they've basically been able to conflate the two. But anyway, let us continue. Peter explained that he finished at the school in the 1980s but at the end of the 1990s he found himself talking to locals in the village and it seemed that, and I quote, Someone said they'd heard from the kids at school that there was a tramp living in the bushes. Yep, same thing, but now he had smash bottles that he would lunge out of the bushes to try and stab slash cut you with, end quote. So clearly Freddy Krueger had lost his appeal by the end of the 20th century. Yet this particular story hasn't actually gone away. Peter went on to say that an old classmate now has a child at the same school, and according to the child, the kids still say the tramp lives in the bushes, but now he's got syringes and they're possibly full of poison or whatever. So the story has survived into its fifth decade at least without anyone ever actually seeing him. And the respondent added that he thought, and I quote, the mythic tramp is being passed down from school year to school year, each year adding their own thing to him, end quote. So it certainly seems that this particular story has grabbed the attention of the children who keep their monster alive. It's really unlikely that the teachers are fanning the flames of the legend because they probably find it quite irritating actually. But the way in which the figure evolves to suit the era in which he lives is an example of the fluidity of wider folklore. It does actually show in real time how legends do morph, they change, they evolve, which is why sometimes if you share a piece of folklore like on a podcast or on social media, people will go, oh, that's not the version I know. And that's just because of the fact that folklore does change. Normally it takes a lot longer, but obviously these demonstrate as well also how oral transmission can then change the way that the story is received or spread or anything like that so you do have to wonder what the next iteration of this particular character will be what he'll then move on to because it'll again it'll depend on what children's preoccupations are at the time Now, the final collection of stories are those that are started or spread by teachers rather than students. And I thought this was quite an interesting one because it then made me go, ah, when I'm teaching, have I ever inadvertently (laughs) said something which might then give the the student an idea that there's a ghost or something? And to be fair, the college that I work at, and I will mention this more in the universities episode, is reputedly haunted, or at least the building that I'm in is. And I will share a weird story that I had in that episode But I'd never actually told the students that just in case it freaks them out. But now I'm kind of sitting there going, oh, no, have I accidentally done that? Because I do think in some cases it's like a teacher might have just made a really offhand comment and then, boom, you've got this amazing story. But anyway, Ashley told me a story from Queen Elizabeth Hospital, a boys' school in Bristol, involving another green lady who stalks its corridors. According to the legend, she was engulfed by fury that her son either fell or jumped to his death. So here we actually have a vengeful mother rather than the spirit of the child in question. In the 1970s, there was apparently a tile in the yard that said R.I.P. Charlie Peace, and people held that to be the spot on which the boy had landed. Builders removed the tile during building work. But what was really interesting about this one is that Alex then replied to the thread, who'd also heard the legend. So again, a bit like Kelly and Katie exchanging stories. 
Alex and Ashley were able to do the same thing with this one. And in Alex's experience, the older teachers kept the legend alive rather than pupils, particularly because no one actually ever admitted to having seen her. And it seemed that the corridor favoured by the Green Lady was renovated. And then once that had happened, it lost, and I quote, some of its eerie mystique, end quote. And then the myth seemed to fade after that. So there was also a possibility that the phasing out of the school status as a boarding school may have affected the strength of the myth. And I think this is something that we need to bear in mind when we look back at the Red Lady story that Celeste told me right at the beginning at Hatherop Castle. If you're in a boarding school, you're kind of stuck there. And you've not really got anywhere else to go. So you do kind of have to then engage with the building and its perhaps spectral inhabitants. Whereas obviously if you're just coming and going like from morning till night and then you go home, you at least get some respite from it. So it is quite interesting that this one, the, the, the myth may have slowly started to fade away once people no longer had to board there. But there is also no obvious reason for this particular story's existence other than it being a point of interest. And maybe it might have grown out of simply of an eerie part of the school and then teachers passed it on as a tradition. It's, it's difficult to know. But the worst one, and this one, honestly, I thought this was absolutely dreadful, not in terms of the story, but just the way in which it was told. But Darren told me about his first primary school, Walnut Tree Walk in Lambeth. And in the 1980s, the staff would follow a Halloween tradition to tell a story at assembly involving the Victorian building itself. And as he explained, the story was, and I quote, about a teacher that got stuck in the attic and used a bell to break an unopenable window up there and cut themselves on the glass, end quote. Now, as the story went, the school reopened and the teacher was finally found dead in the attic. Furthermore, and I quote, on the anniversary of their death, you could hear a bell ringing from the attic, end quote. Now, the story is harsh enough to tell primary school age children. And obviously for anyone who's outside the UK, primary school is usually from around about kind of like five to 11 sort of period of time. So it's the bit that you do before you go on to either middle school or high school, depending on your children at that point. But the school then went one step further, and as Darren explained, as they finished telling that story to the assembly, someone rang a bell behind everyone at the back of the hall. And I just think that that's a really harsh thing to do, particularly if you've got like five-year-olds there, like that's, that's really not good. But of course, this was the 1980s, and obviously teachers perhaps didn't really know better then. We've all had teachers that were completely sadistic, but Darren admitted that he didn't know if the story was true. But that said, the attics were difficult to reach, so in theory someone could get stuck there if someone moved the ladder. And even more, he remembered looking up at the very high ceiling in a classroom and seeing a hatch in the room's roof. Now obviously he'd been told that story, but seeing how high the hatch was, it cemented that particular story for him. Now this story is unlikely to be a cautionary tale purely because the likelihood of students accessing the attics was quite low. But the tradition of telling the story seems to have come from the architectural features of the building itself. Now, I actually had a look on British newspaper archives just to see if there was actually a news article of a teacher who actually died there. And the most I could find was there was a news article about the death of a former headmistress of the school in 1913. But she had actually left the school some years earlier. So that was the closest link I could find between the death of a teacher and this particular school. So perhaps the story merely came from a need for a Halloween story that then became a tradition. Now, finally, Philip noted the primary school tale about, and I quote, the lad who fell through the roof and broke both his legs, end quote. So this becomes very much a story type. And he suspected that teachers had started the tale at his school to put kids off climbing on the roof. But he noted it was actually the older kids who passed it down. And while he originally thought the story was specific to his primary school, he later discovered the same primary tale did do the rounds in at least a dozen primary schools in Bolton. Now, you won't be surprised to learn there was absolutely no supporting evidence whatsoever. But I do find this one interesting because it features horrific injury, but not death. So it's plausible that someone might fall through the roof while climbing on it and then break their legs. So it's plausible, but it's not too traumatising because the child, as far as I know, survived. So it is a cautionary tale, but without necessarily being as horrific as some of the other ones. But I think because of the fact it's plausible, it then again makes it easier to transmit. So ultimately, what do we make of school folklore? And obviously there were other stories that people told me as well, but they all kind of fell into one of these particular buckets. Now, the common points are that people often said that they weren't sure if the story was true, but often no one actually wanted to go and check to see if there was actually a ghost in that particular area. So people just took it on fact that yes, there was. So there is that element of doubt, but then people are still like, I don't know if it was true. 
There was also the element that stories were told to scare younger students by older students, whether the story originally came from teachers or not. But as I say, it was that passing downwards, almost like a rite of passage, that once you got to a particular age group, you would then hear the story as well. And I, But I think it's also the fact that the stories don't seem to start with the younger kids and move up over as very much the other way around. There's a sense of quite gossipy stories as well, like the ones involving nuns and monks. In a way, they're a form of cautionary tale, but more about the perils of illicit affairs than anything else. But there is, as I say, with some of them, a degree of gossip to them. And then I do think that the stories of the nuns do actually seem to come from schools with actual nuns. So these very much feel like a story growing out of a figure that was glimpsed out of the corner of your eye. And like I said earlier, I do think in a lot of ways some of the stories are cautionary tales to keep you out of parts of the building which maybe are a bit dark, they're dimly lit, maybe they're not particularly safe. And then once that part of the school is then either closed or renovated, the story moves to a different part of the school or it just dissipates entirely because the thing it was related to is now no longer there. So I thought that was quite interesting. The other thing I did find fascinating was just the prevalence of white, grey, red and green ladies in these stories. And I thought, isn't it really interesting that so many of them do seem to be of this almost like mythic anonymous level of, of person where very few of them actually have names attached. Whereas when you then get to the realm of spectral teachers or spectral dinner ladies, they do have names and it does give them that little bit of extra authority that they may be true because they've got an actual person in them. I would be fascinated to know if your school had anything along these lines as well. If you're listening on YouTube, obviously just comment straight below. If you're listening to the podcast, and obviously you can always go and comment on the blog post that this episode is attached to and the link is in the show notes. And it'd be really cool to try and collect some more in case anyone actually wants to do some proper research into school-based folklore and stuff like that. And who knows, at some point I might, but obviously I'll have to finish my PhD first. It is really interesting to see how many of these stories also like pass across to university as well. So we will do universities next week to kind of have the, the school-based ones kind of back-to-back because the university ones are ever so slightly different because obviously you've got a completely different set of preoccupations when you're a university student or indeed a lecturer. So I will leave it there just because of the fact that obviously I'm aware that this episode has ended up longer than usual. Very, very quick reminder beforehand that my book Rebel Folklore comes out on Thursday. If you're listening to this on Saturday, it comes out on Thursday the 7th of September and UK listeners can pre-order up until the 6th with the Rebel 20 coupon code and you can get 20% off. And that's unfortunately UK only and it's only through Waterstones, but I have put the link in the show notes. So it'd be brilliant if you could pre-order because it just basically tells the publishers there's an interest in this kind of content, which means that we get to create more of it. So that is a good thing for everybody. That If you've been on social media, you may have seen Rebel Folklore being mentioned and people receiving review copies and tagging and things like that. And one of the things a couple of people have really highlighted and appreciating is the reading list in the back. So yes, there is a list of recommended books and podcasts that I suggest that you go and have a look at if you want to learn more about any of the figures featured in Rebel Folklore, because of course there is, it's me. Anyway, I promise I will let you go now and I'll see you next week when we do University Folklore. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.